Joining us today is a WWE Hall of Famer. Really, no introduction needed. Ladies and gentlemen, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat is joining us live tonight. Uh, Ricky, thank you, thank you so much for joining us. How's it going? Hey, Steve, uh, doing well. Yeah, great. Uh, in the in the in the process, in the middle of moving. All right. Yeah, just bought a new. Yeah, just bought a new home. So you know how it is when you're taking all the stuff that you accumulated over the years and boxing it up, and then. <laughs> It's, it's, it never seems to end, right? Sure. And also, happy early birthday to you as well. I know you got a birthday coming up. Uh, I just want to wish you the, the best on that. Wow, you're the second guy that's wished me happy birthday today. Uh, I just had a call from Terry Taylor, Mr. Rooster. Oh, yeah. Wishing me, yeah, it's my birthday tomorrow. I'll be a, a very young 64. <laughs> there you go. Uh, now, we're going to tell the fans yeah, coming up where they can see you uh, coming up on March 11th down in Virginia in a few minutes. Before that, uh, let's talk a little bit of wrestling. Uh, you, you once said uh, Andre and Hulk may have sold the show, but Steamboat and Savage stole it. Talking about your, your match at WrestleMania 3. Uh, my question to you, though, is uh, was there ever a match for you growing up that was maybe the equivalent to a, a Steamboat and Savage match of my generation that you either you know always looked at for inspiration or motivation on becoming one of the all-time greats? Well, I'll tell you, I grew up in St. Pete, Florida, and that's where I live now. I went to high school, and I was on the wrestling team, and on Tuesday nights, a couple of us guys, wrestling buddies, we would venture over to Tampa at Fort Hesterly Armory on Tuesday nights mm-hmm. and, and watch, watch uh, Eddie Graham and Boris Malenko and Dusty Rhodes and Dick Murdoch and uh, a very young... Um, Oh, God. Uh, Mike Graham, who is uh, Eddie Graham's son. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I wrestled against Mike in high school. Oh, wow. Uh, he, I, think he went, I think he went to Robinson High in Tampa, and I, was, I went to a high school here in Bogus Sega. A very young uh, Don Morocco, who at the time was a baby face. You know, I'm going back to the uh, late 60s, early 70s, mm-hmm. when on Tuesday night we used to just pile into a car to go over there just to, just to razz those guys. Uh-huh. And... Um, not knowing at that time, really, that uh, I was going to be a professional wrestler, but I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I watched um, on Saturday mornings uh, Gordon Soley oh, with yeah. Florida Championship Wrestling. So, you know, um, looking back on hindsight, uh, you know, never knew that it might have been written in the stars for me. That, uh, But I... I I really thoroughly enjoy watching those guys work. I, I'll tell you this: this was my opinion of professional wrestling back then, mm-hmm. and all of all of us too on the on the wrestling team. We would all say that you know the early matches were, oh god, they were you know they were they were set up, and um, and the finishes were talked about, and then after the intermission, the main events. We knew that the main events were straight up, straight up, up, up and up because of the, you know, the, the kicks and the punches and everything was so real. The blood, especially when I was watching Eddie Graham and Boris Malenko having these Russian chain matches and having this chain kicked around their uh, their fists and pounding each other and sure. and and bleeding all over the mat. And we would look at each other and say something like. Um, you know how many blood capsules they'd have to have to warrant that much blood <laughs> all over his head and his chest and his belly, you know, and it, yeah. and, it wouldn't, and it's not stopping, right? Yeah. You know, so we always thought that the after the intermission, the main event guys, and we said we also said because they're the main event, and of course the money that they make as a main eventer is a lot more than the money that the earlier guys are making. So that's why. You know, these guys are for real. Sure. Uh, now, uh, I want to say, too, uh, skipping ahead, uh, your match at WrestleMania 3, as big as, that, <clears throat> as it became, uh, people sometimes forget that it was in front of 93,000 fans. Uh, when you got out there that night, uh, what did it feel like to perform in front of so many people? Because it was, it's just a sea of people, pretty much. <clears throat> well, you know, I've been asked that question a lot, and um, every time it brings me back, when I... When I came out of the curtain, uh, if you remember, they wrote us down on these these carts. Oh yeah, yep. With, you know, it was me and uh, George the Animal. God bless him. He just it mm-hmm. passed away of uh, 
not too long ago. And I was overwhelmed for a moment there. I said, holy my God, look at the size of this. And then I caught myself and almost went into a tunnel vision and just sort of focused on the ring, you know? Sure. Just, uh, just focused on the ring because it was, it was that overwhelming to me um, to be on that grand of a stage. And also, you know, and you said it correctly, I, I give credit where credit is due because, uh, you know, Hogan and Andre was, you know, was the, the two big headliners uh, for that night. You know, and, and Randy and I, we, you know, we had our two cents worth in, in, in drawing and selling tickets. Uh, they did the angle on with uh, him coming off the top row with the announcer's bell on my throat, you know, and then we went through a series of me trying to get my voice back and, and the big question was, is the dragon going to be able to wrestle again? You know, and um, what what made that even um, so interesting to the wrestling fans is that we were able to do that for several weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, unlike, um, and it's, it's one of the things that the, the business has changed. You know, it seems like, you know, we have a pay-per-view every three to four weeks. So, you know, when you have a pay-per-view and the guy's headlining, that match is over, and the next they move on to uh, a new partner or or a new angle, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, ours, like it, uh, the rope the, uh, coming off the top rope uh, was like in December, and here it is, you know, what was March twenty eighth or something like that, you know. God, it's three months later, and uh, we're able to, you know, add to it each week about is is the dragon going to be able to make a comeback, which. You know, we, they don't have that luxury today like the way we used to, uh, we had it back then. Sure. Now, now with that crowd, too, I mean, you said you had that tunnel vision to the ring, but is there a, yeah. kind, of, is there a kind of pressure maybe put on you? Because, uh, I mean, just that's not an everyday kind of a thing. <laughs> you wrestle in front of 93,000 people. Uh, just, I mean, just the, the crowd size, does it, I don't know, does, does it, is it an extra kind of pressure to perform well, or do you just kind of block it out as best as you can and, you know, do what you know how to do, you know, and just get in there and wrestle? Well, uh, to be honest with you, it was, uh, I was, uh, totally stre uh, stressed out. Um, and then it, it multiplied when it popped through the curtain, <laughs> yeah. started the ride down. And was, yeah. And, um, and then I got into tunnel vision. I think that was a way of, uh, for, for the dragon to escape. Sure. And, uh, and then then everything else just took over automatically about focusing on the match. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the match had so many different angles and, and ups and downs. And we wanted to make it a championship match, even though that Hogan's and Andre's was the world championship. And we wanted to make ours a, a championship match. So that's why we had all those false finishes. I mean, the match went less than 17 minutes. I think the total segment with, the ride down and the ride back might have been over, a little bit over 20 minutes total, but uh, a match that went less than 17 minutes, we had 21 false finishes. Wow. <laughs> and, you know, back at that time, uh, a match would have about six or seven, maybe, you know, eight, you mm -hmm. know, false finishes, co uh, covers where a baby face covers a heel and the heel covers, you know, the, the baby face. But we wanted to make it special. We wanted to make it a championship match. And to make it a championship match, it, we, all those false finishes. Uh, I'm trying to beat him for the championship, and Savage is trying to hang on to it. You know, sure. mm -hmm. and uh, that was a story that we told. And and wrestlers tell you know afterward they're, they're the ones that told us, God, you guys just changed how to make a match. And I said, What are you talking about? I said, Man, all those false finishes. You took the crowd on such a a ride up and down. Up, it was tit for tat and back and forth. And and um, and then I find out later on, you know, so many years later. Here, here we coming up uh, WrestleMania and then getting ready to celebrate 30 years mm -hmm. since uh, WrestleMania three. Wow! And everywhere I go, and I'm going somewhere almost every weekend, uh, an appearance or 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 representing the WWE, uh, speaking for the company, and it never fails that they're they're always bringing up talking about that that one night. 
Definitely. It's definitely going to live forever, if you will. Uh, uh, now, you, you left the WWE. You came back as the dragon, uh, breathing yeah. breathing fire occasionally. Now, I just learned about this yeah. story today, uh, which I think the fans would find amusing. But could you let them know about the time uh, they sent you to get uh, fire-breathing lessons and the incident that followed uh, with your teacher? Oh, yeah. Well, the, uh, the company went to Barnum & Bailey and... Uh, from what I understand, their, their fire breather guy didn't want to teach me or let out the secrets of mm-hmm. really, really how to do it. So they found a little, a little one of those little parking lot um, circuses that you see uh, in in Florida. Yep. I was living in the Carolinas. They flew me down and uh, knocked on this little little trailer. And this uh, very light-skinned, red-headed guy, his name was Brian LaPalm, answered. And he was so excited about showing me how to, how to breathe fire. And um, he was a wrestling fan, and he was honored and all that. And so the big top, the, te- the big tent, mm-hmm. was not finished yet. And he says, I want, he was so excited. He says, I want to show you. I want to show you. Let me show you. So he says, I use kerosene. And kerosene uh, lights up with all these different colors. You know, a lot of people use, uh, you know, uh, grain alcohol or moonshine or whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. But it, that comes out like a white flame. He says kerosene comes out in reds and blues and yellows. So anyway, he's got a, he takes a big gulp out of a cup. He's got a mouthful. Just let me back up. He says, now, when you, whatever you do it outside, Hold your torch and always watch which way the flames are going on your torch. Obviously, you want the flames to be going away from you. That means the wind is coming from your back so that when you blow into the torch, the ball of fire is going to go away. <laughs> and I said, okay. So he fills his mouth up with kerosene, and he's holding the torch up, and he's looking at the wind. And it was pretty gusty. It was pretty gusty that day. Mm-hmm. And just as he puts the torch down to his mouth and blows, the wind shifts, and... He blows out this mouthful of kerosene, and of course, the wind blows the kerosene all over his face. He uh. is now, I'm watching this professional who told me he's been doing it for 10 years, running around the parking lot with his face on fire. <laughs> oh, my God. He said, no, 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 no. And he's patting his face, he's patting his face. And um, <laughs> the, office, uh, the office sent a guy down with me just to oversee everything. And I looked at him and I said, you call, I said, you call Vince up and tell him that we are watching a 10-year veteran <laughs> run around the parking lot with his face on fire. And that uh, this dragon is not going to be doing this. <laughs> and he's the one, Brian LaPalm, he goes, no, 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 everything's cool. Come on, come on. So we started off with little shot glasses, yeah, just a little burst. And finally the tent got put up and we were able to go inside, more of a controlled environment. And and you know we were it was showing me and we ended the day came back the next morning knocked on his little trailer and he shows up he opens the door up and he's got all these water blister bubbles all over his face <laughs> and i mean uh, i scared the heck i said oh my god <laughs> and he was oh no no i just i just you know, i just wanted to keep him to show you it's just as a little joke thing you know and, <laughs> and he took him and he started popping him on his face <laughs> And then we went into the big top, and I worked my way up to where I could do a mouthful yeah. of kerosene. Oof. Yeah. Well, that, uh, I mean, that was just a great story. I mean, your first day to learn from a guy, and that's what happens. So. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and he's the pro, and he's running around with his face on fire. He burned off his eyebrows, <laughs> you know, uh, the front hairline of his hair. Oh. Now, this is a fair-skinned guy with freckles, redhead, light skin. And the next day, I mean, it looked like he's been underneath the sun lamp in his face for a day. <laughs> now uh you've done uh, some clinics around the country uh most recently too up here in right. our, our area for northeast wrestling uh at your age now yeah. how does how does it feel to give back to teaching the superstars of tomorrow do you like being able to train and just show uh, the students you know i uh, i i really do it's 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 one of uh, the ways of giving back passing the torch i, I reminisce and remember how old timers were teaching me and it's you know, I can't do a whole lot of physicality in the ring, and it's only because I had an incident about six years ago to which I ended up with a brain bleed. I was thrown down too hard, and my noggin 
bounced off the off the mat, and um, I ended up with, with what they call a subbar acnoid hemorrhage. Mm-hmm. And the uh, my doctor told me basically he said the left side of your brain tried to separate from the right side, and your connecting blood vessels got torn apart. So your bleed, unlike um, other aneurysms, which are usually on the surface, you know, if you hit your head on the windshield or get hit in a noggin with a, you know, with a pipe or something, it's usually on the surface and they'll drill a little hole in the skull to relieve the blood and relieve the pressure. He said, the problem that I have is, is mine's down inside my brain, down in the brain. He says, there's no way of getting to it. And, and drilling a hole is not going to relieve any blood. It, it's got to stop on its own. And I said, well, what a, what if it doesn't? He said, well, let me tell you, the fatality rate with your kind of injury is 60%. Wow. Six out of 10 don't make it. Yeah. And it's the same kind It's the same kind of brain injury that killed Dale Earnhardt Sr. at Daytona that year. Mm-hmm. He said, That's, you've got that. So I had to wait it out. I was, almost, I was in the intensive care for almost a month. And, you know, God being on my side, uh, it stopped the bleed. It's done a terrible thing for my memory, sure. especially the short term. But everybody says, uh, you know, that comes with age. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And, uh, so, uh, but getting back to teaching, I am. Uh, I usually pick out a, a one or two guys in the in the class that are um, pretty experienced, you know, and they know what I'm talking about, and, and usually do a lot of demonstration. But I, t- I don't, I don't want. I try to tell the promotions uh, the up front, I said, I'm not there to teach these guys how to take bumps, mm-hmm. you know, body slams or suplexes or head scissors or any of that kind of stuff. I sure. said, I want to teach these guys, I want to teach these guys the rhyme and reason of why a match has a storyline to it. Mm-hmm. You know, how do you tell a story in the, in the match? And uh, the psychology part of it and mm-hmm. why you do what you do when you do what you do. Why, why do you do this at the beginning and not, you know, not at the end and and so forth and so on, and, and, and try to teach them that when you tie it all together, and I, the expression I use is connect the dots, at the end of the day, at the end of the match, you have told a story to which everybody that's watching can understand what went on so that they understand winner and loser. You know, good sure. guy, bad guy, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. I've always been the one that didn't matter to me who won, who won in my matches. If I got my Duke raised or the heel that didn't matter to me. Sure. My focus was to get, to get the match over because I feel that when the fans go home and they're riding in their car and they're talking about whoever they're talking about, the wrestler, it's not so much that so-and-so won. It's more about the match and what took place and the things that happened in the match. And, you know, that's what they talk about. And if you can get the match over, it, you know, it really doesn't matter um, in our, I think in our business, the wins and losses, you know, as long as the people go home talking about what a freaking match that was, my God, you see those two guys. Oh my God. You know, <laughs> yep. that was always my goal. And I try to pass that along, you know, because there, you know, some guys uh, get, get disgruntled when they, uh, they said, Oh my, I got to, I got to put him over. You know, they don't worry about that. <laughs> get the match over. Yep. Because at the end, at the end of the day, when you come back the next time in front of these fans, that they, they know that you went out there and you thoroughly entertained them, and they know that they, they just love to watch you work in the ring. It doesn't matter, you know, win loss. I couldn't tell you my win loss record. <laughs> sure, yeah. I probably lost. You know, I, you know, that's some great moments. But you know, I've had over six thousand matches throughout my career. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't tell you. Yeah, I couldn't tell you if it was five thousand to two thousand or, or five thousand to one thousand. I couldn't tell you. Sure. It didn't matter. <laughs> now, you know. uh, as a vet of the business, do you like how progr- uh, how wrestling has progressed through the years, uh, especially the ones on TV now? Or you know, uh, did, did you ever basically imagine how big it would ever become back when <sighs> you were wrestling? You know, when uh, at the you know at the very first WrestleMania. Um, my personal feeling, you know, at Madison Square Garden and um, the special guests that were there, that Vince said something that was big. Um, I didn't, I didn't, none of us knew at the time how it was going to grow into what it is today. And it's a global company, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, over a hundred countries or 150 countries watch WWE. You know, it's, 
it's a mega wrestling production. Um, I didn't know back then, but I, I had a feeling that something big's happening here that is, you know, way out of the box uh, from what I was so used to um, in territorial wrestling, you know, little studios, 50 people, you know, and you do your thing and then you go out and you go to these towns, Monday night town, Tuesday night town, and then come back the next week, Monday night town, Tuesday, you know, same towns, you know, mm -hmm. um, that was a major difference, almost a culture shock, you know, but sure. not knowing that it, how it was, it grows uh, by leaps and bounds the way it is today. Sure. Uh, now, I, I know you're a busy guy. Uh, we just have uh, a few fan questions for you. One coming from uh, Ryan Stewart uh, in Poughkeepsie. He's asking, you worked with Paul Jones. A lot of younger fans don't know about him. Uh, can you maybe tell Great. us about him as a wrestler and a manager uh, working with him? Well, you know, Paul, his, uh, he came along. Um, his, uh, his era was before mine. And uh, I'm going to say probably the last five years of his career uh, or eight years of his career, you know, was the last part. Um, so he was brought up old school. He was very good in telling a story. He was very good in, in being a salesman out there. Most of the time that when I knew him, he was a baby face and we were actually tag team partners at one time. And he turned heel against me. And uh, which really got over. Uh, making him a heel. And uh, he had a great mind for the business, you know, good psychology. And he could sell his ass off in the ring, you know, when, when the heels really getting some heat on. Um, wasn't the biggest of guys, you know, maybe five foot nine ish, ten ish, mm -hmm. but, you know, uh, could, could really work. You know, I was, you know, one, one of the best workers in the, in the Mid Atlantic region. Sure. Now, uh, also, we have a question from Rick Malvey in Fishkill, New York. He's asking, uh, when you wrestled Jericho at WrestleMania, he says not only were your, your famous uh, snap hip tosses on point, but you still very much had it. Uh, you, uh, now, he's saying your career could have also went another 10 years uh, as a solid worker, but why did you leave so quickly pretty much after uh, his feud with Stunning Steve and WCW? Um. Oh, that was back in the early 90s, well, 94-ish um, with WCW. I herniated a disc in my back between the L4 and L5. And um, I'd, uh, I'd put in 20 years, and I just, and, I, and, and to be truthful to, to everybody out there listening, um, you know, when you're an athlete, one of the first things that go, that you know that, slow down and don't recover like maybe other other parts of your body does is, is your legs and i started to feel that you know as i was getting into my 40s and um and then when i herniated a disc in, in my back and uh, i went through three months of rehab in a swimming pool you know i i, I felt you know I, what i wanted to avoid was a rupture and so I said, you know, 20 years in and financially I was set up. Okay. You know, I wasn't the, the richest guy in the world, but you know, I, I had plans for the future and, uh, I just felt it was, a, it was, it was a good time. Uh, I didn't want to make a big deal out of it. You know, like, uh, Ricky, Ricky Steamboat having his retirement match. And, mm -hmm. Or I certainly, I certainly did not want to, uh, keep going to which you see a lot of the wrestlers that come back after so many years and they are just a, a fraction of what you remember them by, you know, in the ring. And I didn't want fans to say to me, uh, you know, Ricky, maybe you should have stayed out. Yeah. You know, it was, uh, but even with that performance with Jericho and, uh, you know, with me, Snooker and Piper and God bless both those guys who have passed. Um, I was, I was, pretty much hands-on training at, at, at the, uh, the WWE school. So I was in the, I was one of the few guys, one of the few trainers that could go one-on-one -on -one in the ring at any time or any day, you know? So I stayed pretty active ring wise. Um, and then when I, and then after that match at WrestleMania, I think it was WrestleMania 25, 
you know, Vince came to me and said, look, uh, you really surprised everybody out there about, you can still, he said, you old fart, you still got it. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'm going to put you in a match with uh, one-on-one with Jericho. And that was uh, the next pay-per-view. I think it was like three weeks later at Backlash. Yep. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we were able to go out there and go almost 20 minutes. And, and, uh, and it, you know, Stephen, from there, um, the match, that, that took the match of me and Jericho. We went overseas and we wrestled through Japan and Hawaii. We came back to the States, we, and uh, the crew was then going through the Mid-Atlantic region, through the Carolinas and Virginia and, and uh, Georgia, and I was wrestling Jericho every night. So that one match ended up maybe another 20 or 25 matches. Wow. You know, it was like we, I was back on the road again. Here I am in my mid-50s, and I'm back working every single night. <laughs> and uh, and God bless Chris Jericho for really taking care of me and... Uh, what a prince of a man, you know, but yeah, Uh, uh, feeding feeding me for those arm drags and uh, and allowing me to, to get up in the air like I used to when I was younger and and the fans just, uh, that's all they wanted to see, you know, sure. Just do some Ricky Steve stuff. And, uh, you know, it was well worth the ticket. Oh, definitely. Uh, and the last question we have from Randy Hammond. Uh, he's asking, you know, many wrestling fans consider your match with Macho Man uh, at, at WrestleMania 3 to be one of the best matches of all time. But do you think that is your best match? And if not, uh, what is? Well, you know, I'm also asked that question a lot. Um, that match was one of my best matches. Uh, and I'll tell you, as you would know, Steve, back in the day, a lot of times, when two guys get in the ring, they don't even know the finish. Yep. And the rest of the matches, you feel it, you call it, right? Mm-hmm. On the fly, for the moment. You know, but Randy, we, we knew the scope of this was going to be big because we kept hearing numbers coming in, you know, like 50,000 tickets sold at the Silverdome, 75,000 tickets, 80,000, 90,000, you know. You said, oh, my God. And then the buy rate, you know, the people, you know, buying in for, you know, the pay-per-view and, and – and so we had the idea, hey, to, hey, you know, tip our hats to Hogan and Andre, you know, but, you know, we're going to go out there and steal it. You know, with that many people watching, let's let's really go out there and, and make a statement. So uh, putting together something like that with 21 false finishes and trying to remember all 21, that's, that's what I was talking about earlier, about being so stressed, mm-hmm. trying to remember 21 false finishes. My goodness, you know, <laughs> yep. and... You know, what's next? What's next? Oh, yeah, okay, what's next? Okay, and then back and forth. And Savage and I, and you couldn't even tell when you watch, but yep. we were feeding each other on what was coming up next. He would throw out a three or four words, and my light bulb would click. And then I would throw out three or four words, and his light bulb would click. And, it, and through that whole match, we just kept relaying back and forth, make sure that both of us are on the same page, that he's not going to try and do something over here, and I'm going to be trying to do something different. Next thing you know, you got two guys that, doing something totally different and and what happens they get hurt yep so we were on the same page throughout that whole match at, uh, and i'll tell you something too mm-hmm. real quick um i was so relieved when it was over i was so relieved i remember like it was yesterday going through the matches and going through the false finishes and like okay that's 12 that's number 15 that's number 18 Three, you know, three more to go, you know, 19, 20, 21, and then the finish, right? Uh-huh. I was just, it was, it was such a relief, you know, it's almost like I looked up at God and I said, oh, it's <laughs> over. It is finally done. You know? Imagine- but I've had, um, the answer to the, you know, the fast question, I've had some real favorite matches when I was teamed up with Jay Youngboy as a tag team there in the Carolinas. What a tag team we were, we were. And I have gone on public on saying this, that uh, the five years that we were together as a tag team was probably the most fun time. You know, you always try to make your work enjoyable. Sure. And, uh, and, and also sprinkle in a lot of seriousness uh, so that the fans can get the story. But it, it was yeah, so relaxed and so fun. You know, we worked with Jack and Jerry, the Briscoe brothers, Sergeant Slaughter, and, you know, uh, his protege kid under, under his wing, uh, Don Carnoodle. That was, that was so much fun. I mean, uh, yeah. 
it was one of those type of jobs in which you get up in the morning and you are so happy to, to be going to work. Definitely, definitely, definitely a magical match. Magic was made that night. Uh, now for Saturday, March 11th, Classic Pro Wrestling presents Saturday Night Slam, where all the proceeds will go towards the Special Olympics. Uh, you and your son Richie will be at the West Point High School in West Point, Virginia, along with the Rock and Roll Express, Magnum TA, Axe, Tito Santana, David Hebner, and so many more. Uh, what can you tell your fans that are coming out there to see you on March 11th, uh, who maybe who have never met you before? Uh, any any words for the fans coming out there? Well, you know, uh, what an opportunity for fans to uh, get a picture and get an autograph uh, with maybe some of the superstars that they heard about. And, and, and then that you can, you know, they, they go on the website and, and, and watch matches of them. But now you get to meet the person in real life. Uh, you know, opportunities like this don't come around a lot, you know, uh, and it's just going to be a one night affair out of which you get all these guys that big names and, you know, even, even Hinder, the referee uh, for my match, you know, at uh, with Randy Savage. So, um, you know, it's, what, what can you say about being able to come out and see some of these um, guys that really laid a lot of groundwork to, uh, for the future stars of today, you know, I've I've gone on record on saying that during that time in the 80s and 90s, that was sort of a golden era of our sport. Mm -hmm. You know, um, a lot of big names came out of that in which we laid a lot of groundwork, uh, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears for uh, for these guys today. Definitely. And, uh, this is a great opportunity for these fans to come out and shake hands and, and talk and and, uh, and get, get a pitch with, a, with somebody that you thought was, that you might have just watched on um, on YouTube, you know, <laughs> yep. a match twenty years ago, and then you <laughs> actually get to meet the guy. That's right. Uh, well, yeah. Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, it's been an honor. Thank you so much for joining us. The, I know the fans can't wait to meet you on March eleventh. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, you know, we wish you nothing but the best. You know, let me say real quick. You know, uh, we campaigned in that. Uh, I understand that uh, West Point, Virginia, is not too far from Richmond. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember going to Richmond, Virginia at the Coliseum there on Friday night and wrestling there in front of those uh, Virginia fans and, and, and uh, Richmond and Norfolk and Hampton, you know, the, the, that part of the, uh, uh, the country. Those fans are really always very good to us. And I will venture to say that I will have some fans that uh, back in the day remember watching me live and now they come back and see me again. Well, definitely, definitely going to be uh, a night uh, nobody should miss, and especially with all the proceeds yeah. going towards the Special Olympics, uh, you, you can't yeah. you can't beat out on this night. So, uh, Ricky, uh, the Dragon Steamboat, thank you so much once again. Uh, we really appreciate it. All right, Steve, thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's been fun. <laughs>